You may be seated. The final case for oral argument this morning is Powell versus uh, Mark Keel, Chief State Law Enforcement Division. It's a wizard. You, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Are you prepared to go forward? Yes, sir. You may approach. Chief Justice, members of the court, my name is Adam Whitsett, General Counsel of SLED, here on behalf of the appellants in this matter, asking this court to reverse the decision of the trial court. Submit that SLED is not acting illegally, improperly, or unconstitutionally by following the plain language and clear intent of South Carolina Code Section 233490 and using computers to make public sex offender information available to individual requesters by the electronic means of the internet. We believe where, does that it the say you, where, where does it say in that statute that you can utilize the internet to, to accomplish this? Your Honor, we believe that the language that was... You want the part that says you may be uh, transmitted? You know, it says the use of computerized or other electronic transmission of data or other electronic or similar means. We believe that that clearly intends the use of exactly that, computers. So transmit means publish on the internet. Your Honor, in this case, transmit means make available to requesters as SLED is doing in this case. Yes, Your Honor, we believe that that is the case. That in, in fact, an individual must go on SLED's website, must navigate to the appropriate page, must submit a request for information and SLED then responds to that request with the publicly available information. And we believe that with Act 384 in 1998 that the legislature specifically mandated that SLED make this information available and authorize the use of computers and other electronic transmission of data to accomplish this mandate. All right, sir. Some of it's not correct, though, right? I mean, this guy, if you look him up, it says the victim was a 12-year-old girl. Your Honor, a little... we submit that the indictment in this case and that the respondent in this case did in fact plead, plead guilty to criminally soliciting a 12-year-old girl or 13-year-old girl. The, the record goes back and forth, but the indictment is very clear that it is a 12-year-old girl and that is the basis of that information, which is on the Richland County you, Sheriff's You Department. do agree, don't you, that South Carolina's registration statute is the most onerous of all the statutes in the country because there's absolutely no opportunity. It's not a tiered system and there's no right at all to ever petition for removal. I would certainly agree that South Carolina is the only state that has mandatory lifetime registration for all offenders subject to, of course, the three statutory enumerated avenues of removal. Well, even you don't even get removed if you're pardoned unless there's a finding of innocence. It's, it's really quite strict. I mean, you, you'd have to agree with that. I will agree that that is our, the legislative intent and that our, our legislature is the only one that has mandated lifetime for all subject to those avenues of removal. But Does I that present a due process uh, question or...? A constitutional question of any sort in your mind? I do not believe that that implicates a constitutional question of any kind. As, as this court has routinely held, and as this court held as recently as 2017 in the seminal Justin B. case, in that case, this court found that the lifetime public registration without judicial review of a juvenile was not punitive, that the lifetime public registration without judicial review of a juvenile was in fact rationally related to the purpose of this entire scheme, which is to protect the public, including the children of South Carolina. That, from that purpose, is that just frozen in time? I mean, we have to go with that forever? I mean, without the state ever really proving that there is a correlation? 
Well, Your Honor, the purpose of the statute as enacted by the legislature is, in fact, that purpose. And I believe that the record in this case, we have submitted evidence into this record that it does, in fact, protect the public. As this court has long held that the registry protects the public because it notifies the public of the offenses of certain offenders who have demonstrated themselves capable of committing it certain crimes. It just seems conduct. to me uh, that we have so expanded our registration requirements over time that it's almost diluted the efficacy of protecting the public. For example, I got on the website. I put in my home address in Conway, South Carolina. I have 44 sex offenders that live within a mile of me. What in the world am I to do with that? How does that help the public? Your Honor, it is that public availability of information that allows citizens to make informed decisions about how to go about their life or how to avoid potential victimization in this case. And, and that's what the evidence in this record goes to. The availability of that information promotes community awareness. It simply gives in individuals. Odds who, are a, lot, a, a number of those 44 people that live within a mile of me <coughs> have no propensity to reoffend, but they have no avenue, no way ever in their lives to show that, why isn't that violative of, of constitutional rights? Your Honor, because, that, that, because no constitutionally protected liberty or property interest is implicated by the lifetime <laughs> registration, as, as this court has held throughout the, the history. Yeah, but what this about court, Dykes? Of yeah, sorry, what about Dykes? Dykes we all went to through the Glucksburg <laughs> analysis. It's not a, you know, it's not a protected right. But it still didn't withstand um, just rational relationship standard. And in, in Dykes, I would submit, Justice Kittredge, that the arbitrariness found in that case was the disparity uh, that the statutes imposed, that some folks got judicial review and some folks did not. And, and of no, course, no, that, let, let's look at what we said. The well, majority electronic said. monitoring was a strong feature of that. That, that case. was my, my next statement, Your Honor. And obviously, electronic monitoring is much more of a governmental intrusion than the registration requirement at play in this case. But obviously, wouldn't you agree that these registration requirements that. over time have gotten more and more intrusive? Your Honor, I submit the record does not bear that out in this case that this respondent has never been subject to any residency restrictions, never been subject to GPS monitoring, has never had any governmental intrusion into where he may go or with whom he may interact. And there's simply, the record does not bear that out in this case. And there's certainly nothing since this court's decision in well, Justin Well, B. what we said in Dykes was the complete absence of any opportunity for judicial review to assess a risk of reoffending is arbitrary and cannot be deemed rationally related to the legislature's stated purpose of protecting the public from those with a high risk of reoffending. So why why doesn't that logic and that holding carry over to this reg lifetime registration requirement? Because that was predicated on the the red the invasiveness of the GPS monitoring in which an individual's movements was in fact intruded upon and monitored by the government. And that's simply well, not the same. case yes, with registration. Is. Yes, it is because you have to register not just once, but I think this particular defendant is biannually. Some are four times a year. And you, if you have to go in personally, and each time you move, you have to give uh, notice of your movement to your new address. So why isn't that government monitoring? It's simply not the same as the monitoring that is seen with GPS, which is a constant monitoring system. And simply having to appear two times a year is in no way the same type of intrusion or invasiveness as constant government monitoring, especially in the context of the basis of those decisions, which was U.S. versus Jones, based on the, the, you know, the constable constantly sitting on your shoulder and monitoring your actions which is simply not at play in the registration context or in the context of, uh, with, with this particular respondent. It, it just simply put, the passive availability of information or even having to go two times a year is not the same as active GPS monitoring constantly 
and I, I don't believe that that, that rationale um, changes the you, you make, of this court. You make or reference to would Justin, overrule. You make reference to Justin B. as supporting you. But was Justin B. ever considered in relation to Smith B. Doe's requirement of the effects prong of the Smith B. Doe uh, test? I believe that Justin B. is certainly... Uh, I don't think we've ever applied the, the effects prong of that test to any case we've heard. I believe that throughout the, 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 the course of the precedent in this, case, in, in this state that, uh, I mean, it is not, not a punitive that, I mean, the, that Justin B. and the rationale of Justin B. does, in fact, uh, um, evidence the longstanding precedent of this court and that it is not a punitive or that it does not implicate a, a constitutionally protected liberty interest. Are we then prevented from applying the effects prong of the test in Smith v. Doe? Your Honor, obviously this court is free to change this court's precedent as it sees fit, and so I'm not going to stand here and, and say this court is Well, that's obvious. I'm asking you for something else. Do you know of any reason why we shouldn't apply it? Your Honor, I believe that it is unnecessary to resolve this case, and I believe that the existing precedent is If there. the precedent didn't cover it and never dealt with it, I'm looking for an answer from you or a comment from you as to why we should not apply it. Your Honor, I believe it's simply unnecessary to resolve this case based on this court's other existing precedent and that there remains no constitutionally protected liberty interest at play that would affect a change in any of the precedent in this case, or that well, would if you it, maybe maybe we would have looked at it differently or decided it differently had we applied the effects prong of Smith v. Doe. And Your Honor, would you do you think we would? Have? I do not believe that would have changed the outcome of, of this particular case. Why not? Because I do not believe that the registration requirement on this particular respondent or, or anything that has occurred in the registry changes the nature of uh, his registration requirement or changes the constitutionality of it. I do not believe that the effect, <coughs> again, this respondent has never had work restrictions, has never had... Well, he's lost jobs because of it. He couldn't move into the neighborhoods that he wanted to move into. Uh, so you can't say there's no impact on him whatsoever. He's had public shamings. Hasn't and, Your Honor, I don't believe that SLED's passive uh, transmission of, of evidence has publicly shamed th this respondent. And I don't I'd believe be ashamed, that wouldn't you? Your Honor, I, I suppose the availability you would... of, of criminal justice information is, is very different than public shaming. And I, I submit that the purpose behind it is, is certainly not intended to shame. And I do not believe that, that SLED... I, I know that SLED's intent is not doing so. So and, what's your what's, the information. what you're saying on that point, uh, which may may be somewhat minor, is that he's not being publicly shamed, but he still might be ashamed of what he did. Certainly, Your Honor, and and individuals that that commit offenses like this may certainly feel that shame, but it is simply not attributable to SLED or SLED's <clears throat> making available of of certain criminal justice information or public information via computerized or electronic transmission or, or you know, via. Is there a severability clause in this statute? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, just general conversation, what is the uh, objection to having at some point some meaningful judicial review or some meaningful review of continued status or continued requirement to register? Your Honor, I believe that that is, and any objection to that is one that was done by the legislature, and that is purely a, a legislative prerog a prerogative in that regard, and whether the legislature may decide to change that and change its objection. Is lifetime, is lifetime mandatory registration, does that implicate any type of liberty interest? No, Your Honor. I would submit that this court has consistently found throughout its precedent that it does not implicate a constitutionally protected liberty or property interest. Why isn't it arbitrary to treat every sex offender the same way and not have a tiered system like the feds do, everybody, including juveniles, 
and, and to further not provide any right of judicial review to determine whether the purpose of the act, which is to protect the public against those individuals who have a risk of reoffending, is actually being satisfied. Your Honor, I believe that uniformity is what is sought with this entire statutory scheme, and uniformity is what we have, and that's the exact opposite of arbitrary. It is, it is we treat all similarly situated registrants the same, and that is But they aren't similar, but they're not similarly situated. Some don't have a risk of reoffending. I mean, you'd have to agree with that. Do you believe that every single person on this registry, if given the opportunity, could not prove that there was no risk of reoffending? Your Honor, I believe that when you look at all of the evidence in this particular case, that there is a risk of reoffending, and that every in medical every case, I, I submit that any in individual who's demonstrated themselves capable. Well, why isn't there? Conduct, I mean, we're not talking about pedophiles here. Why isn't there a risk of reoffending if you are guilty of armed robbery or if you're guilty of burglary? Those people reoffend too, but we don't have a registry for them. And I submit, Your Honor, that if I our understand legislature, when we're talking about pedophiles, and some of these people are pedophiles, but some of them aren't, and some of the things that they have been convicted of or pled guilty to uh, may not even have much of a sexual overlay except the judge has found under that provision of the act that they need to register. Certainly, and, and I would submit, Your Honor, and I, I'm out of time. No, you may answer the question. I submit, Your Honor, that, that if our legislature determined that it was in the best interest of the public of South Carolina to create a burglary registry or some type of, they certainly could. They have the constitutional authority to do that, but thus far they have not yet exercised that legislative prerogative to go there, but that doesn't undercut the constitutionality of this particular scheme because our legislature has determined that it is the best way or that it is a way to protect the public, and this court has always upheld that it is a rational, rationally so related to that a, legitimate government purpose. It wouldn't be protecting the public to list a burglar who has committed multiple offenses it certainly on could, the register? Right. It certainly could, and our legislature has the authority to but, do but that then, if they see fit, and, and there would be no constitutional infirmity why not? to that. Why not? He's a convict. People on this register are convicts. Uh, they're being treated differently. And supposedly the reason being because of their, uh, the idea that they might repeat the offense at some point in time. And Your Honor, Oh, for that matter, what about multiple DUI? And those are all certainly policy reasons why our legislature may want to choose to create such a thing, but it is simply their legislative prerogative that they have not yet seen fit to do in this instance. And as this court has always held, that, that I mean, courts do not, we, we should not second guess the wisdom or the folly of the General Assembly. There are certain things that you are- just tell them when they've done something unconstitutional, and that's what we're about here today. Is that not right? That is absolutely well, correct, do you, Honor, do you, but, May I ask a question, Chief? Please do. Do you agree that there can be a scenario where the legislature oversteps its bounds in a constitutional sense? Of course, Your Honor. All right. Say a speeding ticket. Anybody gets a speeding ticket has to register for life and pay a fee every year. I mean, that would be ridiculous, right? And so you would think the court would have the authority to say, you can't do that. Would you agree with that? I believe the court could entertain a constitutional analysis in that scenario. But well, take that I hypothetical. Would you agree that that would be unconstitutional? I See, I believe in the, in the narrow you hypothetical want, that, that you're just, talking, that because we is, don't have the same purpose at play, and, and I don't believe that you could articulate the same See, that's a dunk. That's it. a dunk shot. That's, to me, easy. And the fact that you hesitate um, gives me some uh, concern, but I understand your position. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We'll hear again from you in reply. Mr. Osmond, we are going to ask that you delay approaching the podium until we sanitize it. Yes,
You may approach, Mr. Osmond. It's interesting seeing you on this side of this argument, Mr. Osmond. <laughs> it has been a long time. <laughs> Every other jurisdiction in the country agrees with Dennis Powell as to, the, as to our statutory argument and as to our constitutional argument. Every single legislative branch, every single executive branch, including the U.S. Congress, and every single court agrees with both of our positions. See, this statutory scheme is three separate statutes stacked together over time. And you've never been, no, no litigant has ever brought you this statutory scheme in this format before. They've never looked at it properly. Your five cases, starting with Wall, Hendricks, Ronnie, and then the two Justins, you, you've never been asked to, to add these. You've been, you've been led to believe this is all some conflation. Our U.S. Supreme Court on March 5th, 2003 made it clear these statutory schemes, Wetterling creating the registry for law enforcement purposes, if we'd have left it alone, we'd be fine, wouldn't we? We'd be fine. If, even if Justice Hearn, they wanted to know where my client's tattoo was or when he has to have his chest cut open, that he just had heart surgery, you know, he had a heart attack during the pending of this case. They could have that. Chief Stewart can have that. But you shouldn't get it when you go and check your address in Somerville, South Carolina. Conway. Conway, South Carolina, excuse me. Chief Kill, not Stewart. He's retired. So. <laughs> but you're, they you're doing good. They shouldn't. <laughs> Listen, so then Megan comes along in 94, and Megan says, Registry Plus, we're going to mandate NCIC style public access by request. That's all that existed at the time. It's not the same as internet registration. We know that from the statutory scheme itself, right? Every other state still has internet still has public access by request. In fact, you didn't know this, Justice Few, those states that limit publication, guess what they do? If you really wanted to know where Dennis's tattoos were, you could go back to that old NCIC system on that website, and you could ask for that the same way. Pay the $25, and you're going to get all this extraneous information. Look, the thing that do has doomed the registry, you're right, is not the registry. It's what we've, we've just continued to throw on it because, as you made the point in Ragsdale, there's nobody speaking up for these folks. That's what the Constitution is for to speak up for the folks who are never going to have a constituency. All right, Mr. Osmond, you brought that up. Let's talk about the constitutional claims. You said that uh, we've not addressed these particular claims. Would you talk to us about those first? You've not addressed, so if you look at those three separate statutory requirements developed over separate periods of time and stacked on, the last one being Internet registration beginning in about 2000 when all the states adopted that. So if you go back to Doe v. Poritz in 95 in, in, in New Jersey, immediately after they passed their Megan's Law, which at that time, remember, you only had two boots on the neck. You had the registry boot that was getting heavier, and then you had the public access by request boot, which was already pretty heavy. But that's all they had. You didn't have the, you didn't have the jack boot of the Internet publication. You didn't have that yet. Those courts, two of them, the, the New Jersey court immediately in 95, and then the Massachusetts court two years later in 97 said, now wait a minute. The registry for law enforcement purposes, we got no problem with that. But if you're going to put this additional information out there, uh-uh, we're going to have judicial review on that. So the New Jersey court carved out the, the second requirement and said, look, you're going to have judicial review before you have public access by request, in, even NCIC style public access by request. If you're getting more than just the conviction, you're going to run that through a court. And, the, and, and then the Massachusetts court said, look, they're so intertwined, you've got to go back and fix your statute. Well, tell us why ours is wrong constitutionally. Ours is wrong constitutionally. So each one of these, independently, the line may be different. So for the registry, I mean, look, I, I, 
maybe they can make the argument about the tattoos and stuff. I, I can, the surgical scars, I can't. But at some point, you cross a line just with that. You cross a privacy line just with, just with the registry alone in terms of what you're in and interference in my life because of the ongoing, continuing requirement with no relief. So it could start out, as we know from, from both Grady and Dykes, it could start out for 10 years, maybe you're okay. And I think the question was asked in Ragsdale, is there, is there, it, can it be time limited? It can be time limited, it can be because it goes too far for, for a registrant who really is a risk, but it, it could also be because even within that time limit, it could go too far because he's no longer a risk before he reaches that time limit. So each Let me one ask you this. If the existing statutory structure doesn't include a time review, in Dykes, for the electronic monitoring, there was a class of cases that had a review. And I do not believe there's a corresponding review for mere registration. It's just lifetime mandatory registration. Is that correct? No, sir. So, so here's, here's what y'all... Y'all already know that we are the only state in the country with lifetime registration for all, and no tiering, no path off, and no limits on publication. Okay. This is my question. It's not a jury argument. We're going to ask questions. Yes. Sir. Okay. What? Oh, Lord, I lost my train of thought. Um, it'll come back to me, and I'll jump in again. Why is our statute violent of that constitutional? Crossing those constitutional well, lines? Well, let's say we agree with you. I'll try to ask it right. this way. Say we agree with you. Since the statutory scheme currently has nothing that we can peg it into, like a five-year or ten-year, wouldn't we, by judicial fiat, be legislating? How do we carve out this to, to render, in your judgment, constitutional? You Look, there's several great cases to look at. I think the best case to look at because it dealt with, it was the first case to deal with the, these three things being stacked on top of each other, these three requirements. I think the best case to look at is the Banny case out of Hawaii because what they did is they looked at it and they said at the end of the process, and it was, it's, a, it's a great, it, it, to me it's, it's a great opinion, it's well reasoned because it, it spells out the three separate requirements. And, and talks about when each one independently might cross those constitutional lines, but, also, but, but certainly when you stack them on top of each other, then you've just got a constitutional line. Let me try my jam. question. This, so so they, they told the legislature, I'm answering your question right now, they told the legislature, look, you had models to look at. We could redo this for you. We could. We could tell you you've got to have judicial... So we review. find that it's unconstitutional for whatever reason, under whatever category, and then we punt it to the legislature and say, you have X time to act, and if you don't, we will? Yes, sir. As far as the... So you're asking about specific remedy. I'm about, what's the remedy? What do you want out of this case? So, it's one thing to say, oh, it's unconstitutional. Oh, no, no, it's unconstitutional. We want two things. And, I, and I'm glad you asked that question because the chief, the chief is going to be interested in this answer. With regard to our ultra-virus argument, it's clear. I'm sorry. I'm closing on a house next week. The bank no longer sends you a check. You don't take checks to closing. They send you a form. Your closing attorney sends you a form. And this is just nonsense, y'all. They send you a form, and it says, send this form to your bank, and they will, they will send me, they will transmit to me your banking information so when you show up for closing, we won't have any checks. Now, if my bank looked at that, or Mr. Witz's bank, for that matter, looked at that and said, now, wait a minute. Mr. Witz has sent us these forms five times in the past, and we know from our practice that he's going to send them in the future. So instead of electronically transmitting those, we're going to publish it on the Internet, his banking information. So we'll never have to send in this form again. You know, these, those things don't mean... So the first thing we're asking for is a ruling that SLED is acting unconstitutionally and just plastering these folks on the Internet without doing what every single other state in the country has done, which is go back and grab the Walsh Act language and amend their statute to allow specifically for Justice Beatty, Chief Justice Beatty, Internet publication, using those exact words. 
47 states use internet. So if they use that phrase, internet publication is allowed, then there is no problem? No, sir. Then you, then you have to cross the constitutional bridges that the Banny Court and the Poritz Court and the Doe Court and even, and really, everybody from Justice Scalia through Thomas, and I'll, I'll go in order, trying to go from right to left, Thomas to, to Souter to Breyer to Ginsburg and Stevens, every single one of them, when they looked at those two cases uh, that were decided in 2003, every single one of them, when they saw internet publication, if you look at those concurrences and dissents, you will see that term, that requirement of publication. What did Justice Ginsburg and Breyer call it in their dissent, which was beautifully written, special the special publication requirement changes everything. It changes everything about these statutes. So Scalia said, wait a minute, I'm not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not reaching substantive due process here. I, I'm not, we're not reaching a decision on that because it wasn't raised. Justice Thomas said, I think in his heart, I've been the victim of this. Publication's different. And he called it out. He called that requirement out. Publication crosses a constitutional line. I'm not reaching, I'm not agreeing with you that we're Let me try a different way, Mr. Osmond. Let's say we agree, and I'm, I, I, I don't want to just focus on the publication. And I know it's important, but globally, we say that either in whole or in part, it's unconstitutional to have lifetime registration without an opportunity for judicial review. Now, I want you to focus on that concept of judicial review. So if you were right in the court's opinion, how would, how would you draft it? How would you, because there's not in the current statute an opportunity for judicial review, how would we do that in a way that would be consistent with separation of powers and not transcend over into the legislative function? I think your remedy must instruct the legislature that there must be a judicial path off. Review. Yes, sir. And I think... So and then it would be up to the General Assembly, and if they did as some states do, <laughs> 25 years. I, then, then that's their prerogative. It's their prerogative with, with one exception. I, I think if you look across the country, the, the next stage is going to be these states that re rejected the federal model, which is three tiers, right? With three tiers, with judicial review and with, I mean, they told us. We, we amended our statute in 2008, by the way, after, after federal Walsh Act. The Walsh Act told us, tier your statutes, and limit. You don't need to push the lowest levels out on the internet. We go into the Walsh Act in, in 2005. We grab the school district language. By the way, we still reject the internet publication language, Chief. We still reject that. Our legislature looked at it and said, we don't want none of that. And they told us why. Why did they not want internet publication? Because they told us. Because we do not intend this act to violate the constitutional rights of those who have violated our state and nation's laws. They told us why they didn't add that language. The, the only attorney general's office in the whole country in all of human history who will ever try to convince <coughs> you that electronic transmission is the same as internet publication just stood before you. There's not a single state in the country who would ever have to make such a specious argument. It does not mean the same thing. So I would do that uh, for, uh, you, you've got to reach that elephant. You can't publish without getting permission. But when you go back and get permission, what the Banny Court did, which I like, you've got to have a judicial path off. And oh yeah, by the way, there's a good model up there at the federal level that's been pre -clear. I mean, all those federal statutes get pre-cleared by the Justice Department. We know that. That's why it took them six years to get that third wall shack, the third piece of this puzzle, out there. States were putting on the internet, putting things on the internet beginning about 2000. It took to 2006 before the Justice Department finally said, okay, not two tiers, three tiers. Ten, I think there's Mr. a Osmond, ten, twenty. Before your time expires, okay. is there an equal protection argument here? Yes, sir. Tell me about it, please, sir. All right, there's an equal protection argument with regard to the point that, that Justice Hearn made. In other words, both of those, you mentioned DUIs. 
Comeback rate for them is higher than the state. Our state recidivism rate is the lowest in the nation right here. Three-year three comeback to prison. Director Sterling, his team, 23%. We have states all over the country saying, how'd you do that? They're high. The DUI offenders, the chronic drunk driving offenders are, are higher than 23%. The burglars you mentioned, they're, they're higher. And, and the highest are drug offenders. So there's an equal protection argument in picking out a, what is more irrational than, than setting an unreachable goal of no recidivism, which is not even, there's no such thing. If you tested us, all of us would have some likelihood to offend, right? And then setting up as your mechanism to reach that goal, let's pick out a, this group who's a lower rate of risk and treat them differently than all those others. So there's that equal protection argument. I would go back to the, to the Hendricks case for the other equal protection argument. I grew up with a guy named Will Hendricks. Played ball with him. He's going to be the great grand, the great uncle of my first grandchild coming in January. He's as good a man as Dennis Powell. He committed his offense in Colorado where he would long be off the registry. But in South Carolina, the law doesn't treat him equally, does it? So there are your two equal protection arguments right there. In any other state in the country, my boyhood basketball buddy would be off this registry. Dennis, Pat Dennis Powell would be off of this registry, or at least he would be applying to get off. We, Y'all, on January 2021, you know what happens? State of Alabama. They already have a path off, by the way. They did that back when the court cases started coming down the pike. On January 1st, 2021, the state of Alabama goes to three tiers with a broader path off and with limits on who they're going to post up on the Internet. Well, unfortunately, we can't do that. We're not the legislature. Chief, our legislature's ready to do it. But we'll look forward to it. Mr. Osment, I made the mistake this morning of telling my law clerks that I was afraid this argument was going to be boring. <laughs> And I just want you to know how much I appreciate you proving me wrong. I appreciate that. I, I, and, and I want to say it's really wonderful to have somebody who, sh who demonstrates, not afraid to demonstrate his passion. I believe everybody believes, look, Ginsburg and Breyer, and then you echoed it with your question in Ragsdale, and the Supreme, and the Supreme Court of Alaska picked up on that Ginsburg and Breyer redemption. Things that don't allow for redemption don't fit well in our system. They just don't. I didn't come here to get three of you. I came here to get five. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Whistler, you will have to wait just a moment while he sanitizes the podium. approach sir thank you mr. Witt said I, <clears throat> I also appreciated the intensity of mr. Osmond's argument but there is something to be said that passion and intensity demonstrated at the podium don't necessarily make him right uh, I want to hear from you uh, response to Justice Kittredge's question that if we decide he is right what do we do and and just accept the premise that he's correct. What do we do? And I think that's the fundamental problem at play here, is that this court would then be required to legislate from the bench and, and create a statutory avenue of relief that our legislature... But we could declare not. threshold unconstitutionality and just stop? And what, what, what happens then? And I, 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 think that, I think that proves very problematic for the continued 
applicability of, of the statute, and I think that. But other courts have done that. They've just they have not undertaken to say what the law should be. They have merely said that the law is written is is infirm. Why why couldn't we do that and leave it to the legislature? Certainly, I'm not suggesting that this court cannot. But I suggest that this court should not, and I suggest that this record or, or this case does not justify the invalidation of the entire sex offender registry, and there's simply nothing in this record that would justify a finding of that magnitude by this court. Uh, I believe this is and has always been a matter for the legislature. And so you don't see a due process problem with this? I do not, Your Honor. Why I, not, please, sir? I simply believe, as this court has always found, that there is no constitutional protected liberty well, interest in humor me and tell me humor me and tell me why not without saying that's what this court has always found. Your Honor, the only the the passive availability of information <clears throat> simply does not rise to the level of government intrusion. It's not. I think there's just too much of a focus on on this. Let is not broadcasting this information. This information is available for individuals, interested individuals, who wish to go seek it out. It's no different than criminal history information. It's available from SLED on the same website. It's simply not what about being broadcast. And I think there's just too much. I mean, it's simply a passive system of information where interested individuals can go gain. How about the, the permanent availability of the information? Meaning you're on the list, the registry, and you can't get off. I don't believe that implicates uh, the availability That's not of a, public information doesn't implicate a constitutionally protected liberty. Being on the register for, for life does not implicate a due process issue. No, Your Honor. There's Why not? no liberty interest at play, and, and the, the, there's simply no government intrusion Well, but we said, or the majority said in Dykes, it doesn't have to be a liberty interest. At, at that time, said it was, it, it was arbitrary, and, and I don't believe that the registration system, and I believe even the majority in Dykes found that the registration system as a whole is not arbitrary and does not function the same as, as the GPS monitoring scheme. So I, I think there is a difference. Well, I think the argument is perhaps originally it did not. And so some of the cases that, that you would rely on uh, were, were correctly and discovered. That perhaps as a threshold matter, when people are initially required to register, it doesn't run afoul of any constitutional uh, rights. But once it gets to the point that the registry becomes more and more onerous, more demanding, more intrusive, uh, and there's no opportunity to demonstrate that it should no longer be applied to you, that there may come a point when it becomes unconstitutional. I submit that the record in this case simply does not bear that out, that the registry has not changed in the context of this individual, that, that the information was all, SLED published, or SLED made available the information in 1999 uh, on the internet. And that, you know, we did that specifically after the 2000 uh, or the 1998 amendments that we believe authorized SLED to do exactly that. Mr. There's simply nothing in this record that has changed since this court's decision in 2017 or, or since that would that would affect or change would you speak to us then from the perspective of the south carolina constitution more specifically the privacy aspect of it certainly your honor we do not believe that the passive availability of this information affects a privacy right or, or this is simply the availability of otherwise public information so Providing being required to provide not only picture description, any particular body uh, uh, markings, uh, the VIN numbers of your car, your car tag, the color of your car, uh, where you might want to move next week. Uh, that that is not invasive in any form or fashion. That is does not intrude upon the constitutional right to privacy embedded in the search and seizure laws of our, our Constitution. It well, well that, not. I, not, not, we're not talking about search and seizure. We're talking about the privacy right. And, and our Constitution affords more extensive rights than the federal Constitution. This court has said that on more than one occasion. So uh, let, let's not talk about it in, in the sense of search and seizure. 
Certainly, Your Honor. Chief, and can I ask the, a question? I know the public I availability of, of that information <laughs> that it, it does not intrude upon that privacy right. I do not believe, Your Honor. All right. I'll, Yes, sir. Well, we have, no. we have three no. questions. Well, first of all, I want to commend you, Mr. Whitson. We certainly commend Mr. Osment, but you have done a superb job yourself, and I didn't want that to go unnoticed. So I, okay. I thank you, sir. Justice Hearn asked you earlier, and the Chief has just asked you about the scope of this law. Does your answer change, or do you think the court's analysis is different in that the South Carolina approach to registration is not just some neat finite defined list, but there's this caveat that gives the court the discretion in what ostensibly may not appear to be a sex-related offense, but the authority to de designate it as such and thus trigger the act of lifetime registration. Does, does, does that affect the analysis? I do not believe that affects the analysis in this case because I do not believe that it, it changes the overall analysis for an enumerated offense like we have in this case. I, I do not believe that, that the existence of the judicial discretion in 430D changes or affects the analysis in this case at all. all right. Thank you for all that, right. Chief. Justice James. What is the lowest level offense that puts a person on the registry for life? G give me an example. The low, we, we, we all know the CSC first and we all know the uh, child sex offenses, we understand that. What's the lowest level offense that puts someone on the registry for life? Under our scheme? Yes, sir. Individuals can go on for indecent exposure if a specific finding is made by the court. How about public urination? If it is not an enumerated offense, and so that would... But there are people on the registry for uh, things like that. Only in the event that a judge made a, a finding of good cause based on a showing by the prosecutor in that instance. And, and, and having presided over instances like that, that is a very perfunctory, brief presentation, and boom, the circuit court judge makes a decision, correct? And I've never actually, I, I, the only instances that I've been involved in that were actual hearings done by courts on that that were certainly not perfunctory. So I. I so argue, arguably, it's not. I've never. The only ones I've been a part of personally were, were actually full but hearings, that, in which case both parties were represented by counsel, <clears> and it was a very in-depth. Uh, um, okay, judicial but, but you're saying that the, that person, at the lowest level, is on there for life, just like the child predator. I'm saying under the period of our statutes, our, our legislature has determined that all offenders should be treated the same. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. This argument is concluded and we are now adjourned. <clears throat>